All right. Uh, so, okay, thank you for uh, all for joining us. So, as, just as introduction uh, as to myself, uh, my background is uh, I did a master's degree in biodiversity management in France. I originally went there to do medical studies, uh, but failed my first year, so I ended up in biology and then uh, by uh, by error and trial and error, I ended up in, uh, in ecology. So back in Mauritius, when I finished my studies, I worked for the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation for about uh, 11, 12 years, so from 2007 and 2018. Uh, I got to do lots of cool stuff, uh, like working on the pink pigeon, uh, radio tracking birds, uh, climbing trees and uh, off-road biking in the mud and obviously uh, playing with gestures. Uh, and since 2019, I've been working at Ebony Forest. Uh, it's, a, it's not an NGO this time, but it's a company that, uh, whose primary mission is to do ecosystem restoration. So we do things like uh, propagating plants so that we can uh, uh, plant, restore forests. Uh, we also do bird work like we used to do in the Motion Wildlife Foundation, but also do work on invertebrates like endemic snails. And we also have a huge part of our work, which is trying to transmit skills and knowledge on conservation. So we have courses that we do. We can teach students uh, skills. Um, also, we take volunteers uh, that we can show them skills in the field. Right. So, I don't know if you, if you want, we can start with the talk already. And um, so the way this goes is uh, we'll go throughout the brief history of, of how Mauritius was colonized and then talk about the Mauritius Kestrel, um, how it declined and then how it was saved. Um, so if people have, uh, don't know about Mauritius, uh, it's here in the Indian Ocean, just east of Madagascar. And it was formed about 8 million years ago by volcanic activity. And about a million years, um, it was colonized from countries around the Indian Ocean, uh, surrounding in the Indian Ocean, from Africa, Madagascar, uh, India, and Australia. And all these uh, species, plant life and animal life, arrived by uh, water on rafts, uh, were carried by wind, uh, so plants, uh, pollen and stuff. Um, birds arrived and carried uh, plant life with them. They arrived in marshes and then um, from there on, these uh, life forms evolved um, and became, and marshes became a, a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, because before men, men arrived to marshes, about 39% of the Martian plants were endemic to marshes. Uh, same for insects, about 37% of Mauritian insects. 80% of the Mauritian land birds were endemic to Mauritius, and the same for Mauritian reptiles. Uh, unfortunately, after mankind arrived, uh, a lot of these species went extinct, and we'll talk about it a bit later more. 46% uh, so of Mauritian land birds were lost, 33% uh, of Mauritian reptiles were lost, got, went extinct. We lost 4% of all the endemic plants and about 40% of the motion snails. And today, 60% uh, of motion plants are endangered and 77% of motion land birds are endangered. Uh, so go back, going back to kestrels, which is our main topic. Uh, so the Mauritius kestrel, Falco punctatus, is a small size raptor. Um, this, this photo can give you a bit of a scale for, for the bird, one of my colleagues holding the bird. So its approximate length is 25 to 30 centimeters long with a wingspan of about 45 centimeters. And uh, despite differences from uh, other falcons, it is a uh, true falcon as evidenced by this uh, indentation here, which is uh, the falcon tooth. And uh, falcons use these to break the necks of their prey. Um, the Mauritius kestrel is uh, sexually dimorphic. Um, this is a female here. Um, and like many raptors, uh, females are larger than males. 
So for example, the weight ranges of males go from 100 to 150 grams, whereas the females are much larger, around 150 to 200 grams. Um, the eye rim here and the sear, which is the skin above the beak, are bluish gray for females and tend to be yellow for, for males. So these are uh, signs that can help you differentiate between the, the male and the female. And, um, and another way to differentiate them is by the voice pitch, where the male is higher pitched, uh, while the female is much lower. So if you can hear this, this is a recording of um, male uh, motor special. Uh, unfortunately, my audio file for the female does not work. Uh, so we'll have to do this one. Um, by uh, throughout the process of evolution, the Morpheus schedule has come about to have uh, developed shorter wings and more rounded than uh, other falcons. Uh, and by relative length, the tail is then longer, uh, relatively longer. Uh, and the bird also has uh, an elongated tarsus, and all this makes an adaptation uh, of the bird to maneuver under canopy. So the Morpheus kestrel has, uh, has become smaller and more agile uh, to maneuver under trees um, to hunt their prey. And another big difference between this kestrel and the common kestrel, the continental kestrel, is that they cannot actively hover, so they can't stay in place in the air by flapping their wings. So they've lost this ability, but they can still glide and stay stationary in the, into the wind by balancing, so kiting. Um, in terms of habitat, the Mauritius kestrel uh, used to be found all over Mauritius in habitats ranging from lowland dry forests to upland humid forests, uh, as well as any mountainous areas that can be found. So in, in this picture, you could find kestrels anywhere from low down at sea level to 500 meters in altitude. Uh, another picture of this to show uh, the kind of habitat you can find kestrels in. Um, the Kestrel's home range is about a square kilometer. And uh, it has been shown through research that they have uh, quite poor natal dispersal, which means that uh, juveniles tend to stay in the territory where they hatched and, uh, and fledged. And you will find uh, juveniles moving from valley to valley, for example, in this map. Uh, you would find them between sites, moving between sites. Uh, but very rarely will you find a kestrel uh, going from one end of the range to the other end. Um, uh, so they are very poor at dispersing. It also means that uh, they will not cross the island uh, if there is no habitat in between uh, to, uh, to accommodate them. Uh, in terms of diet, uh, the Mauritius kestrel is a specialized gecko hunter. So, this gecko here, uh, enlarged here, is the uh, Felsuma de gecko. We have four species of them. And uh, for other studies over the last 40 years, um, this gecko makes up about 82% of their diet. Uh, the rest is made up of uh, agamid lizards uh, and uh, songbirds, as well as uh, shrews and insects. Uh, you'll note that, for example, these agamid lizards and uh, fruits uh, are not part of the original diet of, uh, of the Mauritius kestrel because these were introduced uh, to Mauritius, uh, but because data is only available since uh, research has, is, has started on them, this has been incorporated into their diet. Um, unfortunately, Mauritius kestrels have lost the ability to digest properly, digest uh, mammals because uh, the only mammal that managed to come to Mauritius are Mauritius fruit bats. So they've, uh, we, we have never had rats or fruits before men came to Mauritius. Um, so the Mauritius kestrel breeds uh, starting in August, uh, which is the end of uh, winter here. And uh, males and females start with displays, uh, aerial displays. Uh, um, the male will do food passes, give food to the female, and uh, if she accepts, they'll pair up together and start mating. Um, naturally, they would um, nest in cliff cavities, um, 
all three cavities, uh, like this one. Um, but unlike other raptors, they don't build nests using twigs, uh, but instead they just uh, dig a scrape into the substrate and just lay their eggs in it. Uh, the female will lay uh, between one to four eggs and she will stagger these eggs, meaning the, that she will lay a first egg, uh, leave two days and then lay a second egg two days after, a third egg two days after and a fourth one. Um, this photo here is of a, an old female which laid these three eggs and um, you can tell that uh, she's, she's not terribly fertile anymore by the uh, different shapes these eggs have. Um, the females will incubate for 20 to 30 days before the eggs hatch, but she will start incubating on the third egg even if she has four eggs. Okay, so this is um, an evolutionary, evolutionary strategy, uh, whereas where the fourth chick will hatch three days behind the others. So if, if the female and the, the male have enough food during the season, they will feed all four chicks. But if uh, there's not enough food, they will focus on, on feeding the stronger three. And the fourth one, uh, the runt will probably either die or make it by luck. Okay, so these chicks will be reared until they fledge at about 35 days old, and they will reach independence at around 100 days old, where the females and the female and the male will stop feeding them. And um, I haven't put it in the slide, but uh, kestrels can start breeding the very next season after. Uh, but it take, can take anywhere between a year to six years before they enter the breeding population. Uh, and this is a kestrel at around uh, 70 to 80 days old. So back to where we said that uh, Mauritius uh, the Martian fauna is now terribly endangered. Um, what happened was, uh, since the arrival of men on the island, uh, one of the biggest problems we've had is that uh, we've cut down uh, a lot of the native forest that was present. And over the 250 years or so, we've lost uh, almost all of our native forests and only about 2% are left, whereas everything else has been transformed for either agriculture, urbanization, uh, or has become non-native forest. And this has uh, implications for the kestrel, where before um, forest used to be good quality, a bit like this one, and they turned into degraded forests or, and fragmented forests, uh, looking like this. So for the Mauritius kestrel, it meant that they had reduced uh, nesting cavities uh, because a, a good uh, tree cavity for, for nesting for kestrel would mean that it would uh, be found in an old native tree with a big hole in it, uh, whereas what's left now are smaller trees with no cavities. Uh, the second implication is that uh, it is now harder for the kestrel to hunt in this type of habitat. Uh, so this is, for example, this photo is uh, a forest invaded by Chinese guava. Uh, other invasive species like the, the lianse of Hiptash uh, bangalensis uh, smothers forests and uh, makes it really impossible for kestrels to hunt in it. Um, and here I'd, I'd like to make a, a contrast with uh, a talk that Petra gave in March. Uh, for, so for those who were not here uh, in her talk, Petra showed that uh, continental raptors managed to adapt to urbanization uh, by changing strategies and stuff. But uh, in motions, unfortunately, because of the uh, ecological requirements for nesting as well as for food, um, it meant that they could not adapt to urban areas and instead over the years found themselves, uh, found their distribution contracted to around uh, these three mountain ranges, uh, the Mocha mountain range in the north, the bamboo mountain range in the east and the Black River Gorges in the west until it declined to almost nothing in, inside the Black River Gorges. Um, there was also uh, the change in, in prey species. So 
even in places where there was no urban cities or towns, but were still rural areas, um, a change in, in, the, in the land use, so increasing agriculture in these areas, changed the prey species available for the kestrels. So any areas close uh, in the mountain ridges, close to agriculture, uh, caused a drop in native uh, day geckos and an increase in agamid lizards and shrews. And this had an impact uh, on the breeding success of kestrels. So kestrels in, in good habitat forests breed better and, and produce more chicks than uh, kestrels found on the limits of the mountain ranges close to agriculture. Um, finally, uh, you have other factors that affected the kestrels greatly, which uh, was the introduction of uh, predators. Uh, so the black rat and the crab-eating macaque introduced um, uh, were great predators of uh, eggs, especially. And the uh, feral cats and mongooses would also attack birds on the ground. So these, along with uh, competitors, so the Indian miner, uh, the feral pet pigeons, um, the black rat also again, and uh, also some native competitors, the white-tailed tropic bird. These birds, uh, these species prevent uh, the, the kestrels from finding decent nesting places, nesting sites, because uh, they also, also occupy cavities, and uh, some of them can be really aggressive and, and uh, bulk kestrels to prevent them from using uh, cavities. And finally, what's considered was the last, uh, last nail in the coffin of the kestrel was the use in the 1950s of uh, pesticides like DDT. And this passed into the food chain, so through, through invertebrates and all the way through geckos, and because these are the main diet of the kestrels. Um, this pesticide accumulation caused the kestrels to lay eggs, lay eggs that were not viable. So from there on, the kestrels declined to um, four individuals in the wild. And back in 74, the, the Mauritius kestrel was then the rarest bird in the world. Um, so something had to be done to save this species. And uh, in this, at this time, uh, in Mauritius, uh, a team was, was put up by uh, Carl Jones, uh, who initiated actions to save the Mauritius kestrels. And this was um, focused on three axes. So the establishment of a captive population for breeding, uh, and the production of the uh, chicks would be then used to do releases using artificial nest boxes. And uh, these kestrels would then be supplementary fed until the population has recovered. So this, this captive population was established between 73 to 88. And so adults were captured in the wild before 74, were brought, to, brought into captivity for breeding. Uh, a lot of clutch manipulations were done. Uh, that means that essentially eggs were stolen from bears in the wild, brought into captivity, artificially incubated, uh, and the chicks would be hen reared and later released. Uh, so the RIS program itself would make use of artificial nest boxes as, uh, as is quite common in other countries in uh, Europe or America. Uh, this is an early prototype of nest box. So the Henry chicks would then be hacked into the wild. Um, for those who are not familiar with the falconry term of hacking, essentially you, you bring the chicks into the wild and uh, let them become independent by themselves uh, by feeding them until they start hunting on their own. And at some point when you have observed that the uh, gastro chicks are growing well and are, are starting to hunt, you can start reducing the amount of food you give them uh, progressively until they become independent around the same age that they would do in the wild, so around, at around 100 days old. Uh, you, you would, uh, they would keep taking food if you kept feeding them, but for the purpose of uh, restoring the population, you, you would stop at around 100 days old and let them hunt by themselves. Um, and as the population was growing in the wild from releases, uh, chicks could then, instead of being hacked, uh, 
uh, implying more uh, manpower, they would be then fostered by released uh, cash flows which have become adult. And uh, all through the release program, the, these cash flows were simple, supplementary fed until 95 where it stopped. And uh, so over these years, from 73 to 88, uh, three populations, well, three sites were targeted for release. So um, the Black River Gorges National Park, which we will call the Western population, uh, releases were done from 84 to 94. Um, the second population was started just after in 87, uh, which is the Bamboo Mountain Range or the Eastern population. And about 40 birds only were released in the Mocha range uh, between 1992. So overall, roughly speaking, we're talking 300-ish birds, 330 birds released during this time. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, end of the story and the uh, Kestrel was saved. Uh, also, we'd like to say, but this is not how it ended because we still have to catch up to today. Uh, so what happened was um, the Eastern population rose up to about 40, uh, just under 40 gastro bears and the western population quickly rose up to about 60 birds uh, so 60 pairs of Mauritius gastros and at this point uh, uh, the gastro was deemed saved and um, and monitoring was stopped in the western population but unfortunately after a few years uh, anecdotal evidence showed that there were less gastro seen in the west and a survey was restarted back in 2006. And uh, what was observed then was that, uh, unlike the Eastern population, which kept growing, um, the Western population dropped down uh, from 60 pairs to about 40 pairs. And uh, to understand how it happened, you, you have to find the difference between the Western population and the Eastern population. Um, I forgot to mention the Northern population uh, died out really fast after, re after the releases and none of the release birds were seen again. Uh, and that was probably due to poor habitat and uh, uh, lack of breeding size. So the Western population, uh, the one found in the Black River Gorges, uh, look a bit like this. So the sites are scattered throughout the forest and in the gorges, and most of them are just natural cavities uh, really far apart. Uh, whereas the eastern population found around the Bamboo Mountain Range were found in uh, private hunting domains, so we call, call them shas. And then these sites were really easy to access through motorized vehicles like off-road bikes or jeeps. And what this did for the eastern population was that it enabled this population to become well managed. And so every, every season uh, we could go at the in between seasons, we could go there to install uh, nest boxes like this one. Um, you can uh, observe that this nest box has evolved from uh, from the first uh, prototypes. Uh, for example, this box is a lot longer uh, to pr help protect the, the eggs and the chicks from uh, monkeys uh, reaching into the back of uh, the nest box. Um, this enabled the nest boxes to be maintained easily at the start of every season, we could check the boxes, clean them out, remove uh, rats or uh, bees and wasps. Uh, and this also helped us to monitor the population much easier than the Western population. Um, so we would go there and we would uh, check the boxes until we find eggs. And uh, being able to visit them regularly, you could tell exactly when the eggs would hatch and when these chicks would be ready to harvest uh, for what, well, sorry, not harvest, but uh, would be ready for ringing. Uh, so this is the interior of a nest box and uh, this chick is about 20 days old and uh, just the right age to, for ringing. Uh, so when these, uh, these chicks are ready, we go and just open the box, take the chicks out and we, we ring these chicks with uh, ID rings and uh, a unique color combination, which, may, which makes it uh, easy to identify uh, on its own. Um, these chicks get 
measured all the data gets collected we take blood samples that we send uh, to the uk for uh, for genetic studies and uh, we are able to track these chicks until they are just ready to fledge and this helps to really monitor the population and really know what's happening uh, on the side besides uh, ringing chicks we also bring these adults because uh, sometimes they lose their coloring so you have to catch them uh, one of the ways that we do this is um, by using what's called a bile chartry trap. So it's an, essentially it's a, it's a wire cage in which you put a songbird. Uh, this cage is covered in, in nylon nooses and when the kestrel goes for, uh, for the basarine, gets caught in the nooses and you run after the, the adult and catch it so that you can ring it. I have a short video here. Uh, it goes quite fast, so you have to pay attention to around here. I'll play it again. Um, so the trap is here, and the nooses are floating around. Bird gets caught uh, and gets uh, weighed down by the trap, and you just run after it, uh, catch it, and then ring it. So back to the Western population, uh, instead of uh, being able to monitor the sites easily, uh, in, the, in the Eastern population, you could, uh, within a day, check 30 nest boxes, uh, but it would take you a whole day to climb up the mountain, go down uh, with a rappel to, to find a cliff and check what's inside. So you, in contrast, you would maybe check three, four sites on the Western population, whereas you could do it five times more in the east and uh well unfortunately uh this led to other problems right this graph uh, just shows uh, the percentage of uh, of sites which are composed of nest boxes so in the east you also have some natural cavities but instead of uh, the 75 percent of nest sites being boxes in the west it's about the other way around, so 25% of box and the rest being cliff cavities or tree cavities. And the likely cause of the decline, uh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So between the start of the survey back in 2006 and seven and until present day, so the Eastern population continued to rise uh, to reach about a maximum of about 50, um, 50 pairs. Whereas the eastern population, uh, western population kept declining over the years, and uh, the reasons with that are the most likely are that the natural cavities are a lot more prone to predators and competitors, and this uh, you can derive this uh, hypothesis from the number of successful successful pairs over the season, which are a lot less uh, than the eastern population, so fewer percentage of Pairs in the West are successful in producing chicks uh, than in the East. But there are also likely genetic causes uh, because a few, a smaller percentage of eggs manage to hatch in the Western population uh, than in the East, and uh, fewer chicks are produced by successful pairs in the West. In the West, um, there is a possibility that there is a disparity in food availability but the studies on gecko abundance is hard to do and it has not been done in several years so we are now back to intensive management actions uh, so the idea is to rescue the western population before it declines to to become extinct and in in this optics uh, the idea was to try and make it into a similar state as the Eastern population. Not possible, but to reach as close as possible. So increase the number of nest boxes that would be available for Mauritius kestrels. Uh, find sites that would be really accessible. So uh, close tracks that you could access uh, by using jeeps or uh, bikes. And this would help in uh, doing better maintenance on nest boxes. Uh, is access uh, for monitoring and uh, additionally create, start to create some kind of gene flow because there is no natural movement between the two populations. 
So in this optics, since 2016, uh, release program has started around the Black River Gorges, around the Western population. So uh, this is the southernmost part of the national park, uh, whose, which, uh, li whose limit is around here. And all the green dots are existing uh, used uh, kestrel sites. Uh, the white ones are unused nest boxes. And an area uh, on the edge of uh, the national park and the nearby chasse was chosen for releases. And uh, so prior to these releases, uh, three nest boxes were installed and uh, we did trapping for a month just to secure the area from predators. Uh, and in the meantime, in the Eastern population, would, which would become the donor population, uh, we started identifying uh, pairs that breed early and are known for being good parents for harvesting the eggs that would be taken for, for the program. Um, so in the Eastern population, as the season starts and progresses, we find the, the sites and the pairs that we want to harvest from uh, wait 10 days into incubation for the eggs to become stable and harvest these eggs to be brought into captivity. And the reason we want to take um, the early breeders is so that these pairs can then uh, try a second attempt at uh, breeding and have a chance to, success to be successful. And that would help to limit the, well, not damage, but uh, limit the impact that we would have on the Eastern population, which would give birds. Uh, so these eggs are harvested in uh, portable incubators and are kept at around 35, 36 degrees. Uh, and these eggs are driven very carefully to the breeding center. Uh, and once there, they get incubated until they hatch and, uh, and, and the hen rearing can start. Uh, small video here of uh, of a kestrel chick being fed. So these chicks um, are being hen reared in groups um, using brooders and uh, we rear them in groups so that we limit the risk of uh, imprinting of them imprinting on human beings so once they grow up in, in groups they get to socialize between themselves and recognize each other as their own species uh, so you you wouldn't want to hen rear a lone kestrel chick or uh, maybe two. So you, we can rear them in groups of three to five birds. Uh, and once they are about 20, 28 days or uh, 20 days old, they go outside in uh, a crash. Uh, so it's box outside, which helps them to acclimatize to outdoor natural conditions. So natural lighting and uh, temperature. And at this point, they are very much capable of uh, thermal regulating and uh, adapting uh, to the climate. And once they reach 28 uh, to 30 days old, that's where they get taken to the release site and they get put in the box. And uh, just as the, it was done in the 70s to 80s, they, these chicks get hacked. So they get fed um, in the wild. So they will fledge around 35 to 40 days old. Uh, so that was back in the 70s, 80s, and this is back in 2016. Uh, and they are fed with the program until around 100 days old when they reach independence. And the feeding regime will change until they start hunting by themselves, and then you can reduce the food so that they become independent. Right, so uh, 
Ever since uh, 2016, um, three releases have been done. Uh, sorry, four. Um, three season, three uh, consecutive uh, releases were done in the Belom area, which I just mentioned before. Uh, 47 birds were released there. Uh, this is the limit of the national park, and this is the region. And uh, in 2019, uh, 14 additional birds were released in this area of the national park. Uh, I don't have it here on this map, but there are tracks. Uh, so this is in line with the strategy I mentioned before. So finding uh, release sites along the national park, which will enable easy access for management and uh, monitoring. And the idea is that these birds will feed uh, into the gorges and uh, help build up the population within the western population found in the Black River Gorges. Uh, on our side in Ebony Forest, we've installed and are monitoring nine nest boxes. And we're also um, setting up projects to release birds in this area so that these birds can later enter the population in the areas adjacent to the National Park on this side, on the western side of the, of the National Park. Um, alongside all of this, uh, a lot of education and awareness and sens sensitization is being done. Uh, so at sites, for example, at Ebony Forest and Fernie, where we welcome tourists on uh, ecotourism benches, uh, we talk about guest roles and uh, conservation work. Uh, and here at Fernie, um, a pair of kestrels was trained to come take food uh, so that it could be showcased to the public. So I have a small clip here of a kestrel taking food from the hand. And there are some people who worry that uh, kestrels are becoming dependent, but this is just bonus for them. So uh, just once a day at midday, you'd feed them a, a, a small exotic bird and uh, they would know to come at midday to, to get it. But if you left them on their own, they, they are very well capable of hunting for themselves. And uh, that's it. So in conclusion for this talk, uh, I tend to go a bit fast, but. Um, so what we can conclude is there is always a need for in any conservation project is a need for continuous monitoring because you don't know what's happening if you stop. Uh, and this monitoring helps you to adjust your conservation actions, whether you can uh, relax on your actions or you have to go more intensive again. So the short and midterm actions are, are quite clear for the most schedules. We have to boost the Western population install more boxes, make them manage it so that we can boost the numbers again. Uh, unfortunately, in the long term, there is still a need for ecosystem restoration uh, to get better quality forests so that you improve the diet so that they can find uh, predator-free areas and uh, eventually, hopefully in the future, be able to, to fend for themselves. But, but for the near future, we'll have to keep managing this uh, this bird. Um, so I like to end my stories with a moral. Uh, I'd say the moral of this story uh, could be summarized in a quote. So I'd say, like Winston Churchill, success is not final and failure is not fatal, but it is the courage to continue that counts. And uh, that's what we need. We need to keep going. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think I went a bit fast on my talk like usual. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It was good. Um, we've got a few questions, uh, Denis. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll just pick them up from the, from the chat, but I'm going to usurp the, the, the privilege of being in the chair, or you can't see I'm in a chair, but <laughs> um, that uh, to ask about the genetic diversity, what's the status? Because it, it seems like they all came from four individuals. Is that right? Yes. yes. Um, so the consensus is that uh, the bottleneck, fortunately for the kestrel, was very short. 
<clears throat> and the numbers were boosted uh, rather quickly, and that uh, prevented the genetic diversity from dropping completely too low. Um, there is, there has definitely been an impact on the on genetic diversity, as evidenced by the drop in fertility and, and hatch percentages of the eggs. So, any any egg that has made it is can be considered fine. Uh, any chick that has hatched can can be considered fine in some way, as uh, all of the genetically well terribly altered genetically uh, eggs were were failed anyway. Um, if <laughs> that answers the question, um, yeah, um, were there there were none that came like where there were no populations overseas in zoos or anything like that? So they all at the time, not that I know of, no. Okay, so there's a question from Faraz who is asking, do you get trouble with people using the trapping technique, uh, the passerine bird in a cage, for unscrupulous reasons? And um, it's a um, it's a quite uh obscure technique these days I, I get it that it was um it was an old technique imported from india and is is mostly known to falconers but not not very much not widely known in russia it's a very uh, specific technique that very few people know here and then elizabeth's asking do the kestrel checks imprint on human handlers i think you answered that uh but maybe you want to comment again um, they win off you really easily. They, they will recognize you as long as you keep feeding them, but as soon as you stop, they will, they will forget you and uh, go back to being wild birds. And re rearing them in group um, reduces the risk of imprinting. And Darlene is asking, uh, why do you hand raise them? Um, to increase the chances of success, because um, a lot of the nests in the West fail. <clears throat> and um, because of the lack of monitoring, it's hard to tell how, uh, but it is uh, imputed to uh, predation. So these kestrels are Henriette to boost the number. It, it's a lot easier. There's a, a very high, uh, a lot higher chance of them su of being successful uh, being reared in captivity than uh, being reared in the wild. Um, can I just ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen or maybe I oh, can sorry. feel it from here. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, what number or percentage of birds from the last four releases survived? This is from, from uh, Jan. Okay, so um, these releases were done at the time when I was in the Motion Wildlife Foundation. <clears throat> which I've left since, so I don't have access to that data. Uh, I know from the first uh, two releases, uh, a few birds have been seen again, but because they take a few years to enter the breeding population, we might have to wait a few more years to see if they can be seen again. So the data might not be available yet. Um, I've lost your audio. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a silent talker. Uh, have, have the remaining forest areas been protected in law from further encroachments? This is from Bruce. Is it any um, forest areas that are classified as parks, uh, no one is allowed to touch them. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not much in terms of protection for other areas. Um, there is incentive and um, there is there are projects that are being put up to try and convince landowners to restore the land. Though. Um, just checking that I'm actually on now. Um, does hand feeding the chicks pose any issue for them uh, being released in the wild? I think you've already answered that. Yeah, no, no real issue. No, uh, unless. Um, uh, unless they are being over pampered during during hen rearing and they start to imprint, but if if the hen rearing is done well and minimum interaction is done, there's a little chance of them imprinting and then they will have a, a normal behavior in the wild. 
uh, Kervin is asking, what is the long-term plan with respect or with regards to the alien invasive predators such as macaques and, and company? Is there anything that can be done? Well, um, predators like cats, mongooses, and rats are a lot easier to control. So at Ebony Forest, for example, we've set up uh, a grid composed of automatic killing traps that can keep uh, an area safe. Uh, but macaques are a, a very hard predator to tackle because uh, there are also social cultural uh, issues uh, coming into it because uh, for, for a lot of people in the population, <coughs> Mauritius, the, the macaque is, uh, well, not as sacred an animal as, say, the, the cow, but um, it is part of their religion, so it makes it harder to try and control or eradicate. Um, so luckily for us, uh, the nest boxes help to prevent macaques from accessing eggs and chicks. So um, a spread of nest boxes would help uh, the kestrels from losing chicks early in the life cycle. And that, I think, was the last question. And there's uh, quite a few comments about the great presentation. I won't read them all, but uh, there's, uh, there's a good number of, uh, of comments and, and appreciations. And from me also, thank you, um, Denis, for a great presentation. Um, I see that there's another new message there. Let me see what it says. Um, just uh, more, more thank yous. Uh, so yes, uh, thanks very much. And I think it's um, uh, not the next week, but in a, in a, in a few weeks again, uh, we will have more from uh, Conservation of Birds in, uh, in Mauritius with Veronique uh, Coet, who will be uh, also presenting about the uh, Mauritius uh, Paradise Flycatcher. So check the Learn the Birds website and see what's coming up. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. And th many thanks to you, Derek. Uh, I think it's a great initiative for, uh, for spreading knowledge about birds. That's the idea. So let's keep it going. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Denis. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.